Well, just a reminder, we are starting at 820 now or 920 instead of uh, 930. So we're going to dive in. Uh, Pat, did you get a sheet? I realized I was uh, doing my prep for the 31st of October, and there were no readings for the 31st of October. I had gone from October 24th straight to November 7th. So we found an entire week in the schedule. I it had a very tight schedule, but I found an entire extra week. And so I've rolled everything up. So this is now correct. And what I've done at the very end of the year is I put a snow day. Uh, <laughs> okay. Who knows? Who knows if we if we'll need to use it or not? Just like the school districts do, the tax for snow days on the end. And you know the bishop may be here in the spring, so still haven't heard what his schedule is. So we'll. That gives us a little bit of flexibility, which is great. But everything else will just bump up uh, one week, and we'll do universities and monasteries before the Christmas break instead of immediately after the Christmas break. Well, good to see everyone today. Uh, we're going to be now getting out of the period of Scripture. We'll, we'll actually be overlapping just a tad with what I'm saying, but we're going to be moving from the New Testament world and that history into uh, the history of the early church here today. And so we'll be, we'll be off, the, off the grid, off the map, as far as the New Testament is concerned uh, for the first time. We've we kind of actually been going fairly slow to give the New Testament a little more time than the book does, which is fine. This is not a Bible class book. Uh, this is a history of the entire church, and they go a little faster through the New Testament. But I wanted to spend just a tad more time than they did. But we are going to look today, my plan today is to look kind of more or less at the second century, uh, the 100s. We're going to fluff, uh, fudge on that just a little bit. And uh, during the second century period, Christianity grows, but it doesn't grow. So it grows in numbers of people, but it does not add much territory. So it seems the zeros are a great missionary era. And then there's some more growth, some pretty heavy growth, growth in the 200s. But the 100s, the church kind of more or less stays, but makes a few inroads and a few extra areas. So let's, let's get a map up here. So um, the, the, the bright magenta color here is the color of the zeros, the first century. And if you notice, you know, it starts, the church starts in Jerusalem. And a lot of this is due to Barnabas and Paul and Paul's uh, missionary organization. And so a lot of the growth in the first century is because of Paul here into Greece. Though there are some enclaves there. Paul never went to Alexandria in Egypt, big enclave, big city. Uh, the church was in Cyrene by the end of the first century. And the church was in Rome. And Paul did not plant the church in Rome. He visited it. He uh, wrote to it. He died in Rome. But the church was there before he got there. So that's the first century church. But if you look at the next color, the, the second century purple, which is kind of a lighter purple. Really, in the second century, the church doesn't have much. It pushes the boundaries just a little bit in Asia Minor here, just a few little areas here added in the, the second century. Uh, Carthage sees some growth there in North Africa. Carthage will be an important center of Christianity uh, in the, the 400s. Uh, Spain and a couple spots in Britain. Uh, interestingly, there's an Archbishop of Canterbury. To, oop, let's go back. Interestingly today, there's an Archbishop of Canterbury and an Archbishop of York, and the church started in Britain in the second century in the area where Canterbury is and in the area where York is. So it has some depth of roots uh, in those places. But by and large, and a little bit, I say Southern France, uh, Lyon, uh, we'll talk about Irenaeus, Bishop of Lyon a little bit later, but uh, not a lot of square mileage added in the second century, just a little bit of a couple enclaves here and there. But really, the, the second century church's territory is very similar to the first century church's territory. So far, so good. Uh, there, there's a great argument among scholars how big these cities were. Uh, there's even, there are two schools of thought with Rome itself. There's called the Small Rome School and the Large Rome School. The Small Rome School, uh, Warren Gordon, Small Rome, Rome School, uh, let me make sure you get some sheet there. Small room school says Rome was only about 400,000. It was a tiny town. Uh, and others say, no, it was more than a million. So millions, probably a fairly good guess, but it could be. There's some debate about that. But the other four biggest cities in the empire after Rome uh, 
there's a question about how big they were. So Alexandria in the half million to three quarters of a million range, three quarters of a million range. Uh, Antioch, Ephesus, and Carthage are all similar sized, uh, bigger than Lubbock, uh, at least, more like Wichita, Kansas, uh, you know, three and a half thousand uh, to 500,000, somewhere in that range. Now, I just, I, I just splopped those uh, numbers there. Let's, let's see where these cities are. So what we're talking about here is uh, Rome, right here, Italy, and then just south of it's Carthage, uh, another big city, and Ephesus in Turkey, uh, huge in Pauline circles. Uh, Paul got kicked out of there, Book of Revelation written in this area. Uh, Antioch in Syria, which is where the Christian church first became known as Christians. Uh, Paul, that was his place of uh, launching. When he uh, became a Christian in Damascus, he went off on retreat, but then he landed eventually in Antioch, and it was the Antioch church that sent him and Barnabas out on the initial mission, and then him and Silas later on. And then Alexandria in uh, Egypt, a great center of, of thought there. So these are the five biggest cities in the Roman Empire, and if you notice, there is some overlap with where Christianity is and where the big cities are. Again, Christianity is going to be pretty much an urban movement. Uh, at this point in the church's history. It will move into more rural areas later, but for now, it's an urban phenomenon. So, yeah, Jimmy. Uh, and those three of those five cities are also still the most important, like, bishop placements in the church for the patriarchs. The patriarchs of the Eastern Church? The, and, the West, Rome, and, 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 Rome and in Rome. And Rome. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Carthage. Carthage is not a, a huge Christian center anymore. Uh, Alexandria, not... Antioch, Alexandria, and, and, and you know, in Ephesus, we don't talk about the, yeah. but there is an Archbishop of Constantinople just up the coast, a couple 50, 70 miles, 100 miles, whatever it is there. So, yeah, that's a good, good point. Thank you. All right. So, growing in people more than territory here. So, as I said, much of the center of gravity for this, this period in the church's history is the Pauline area. So, for better or for worse, uh, where Paul planted, the church grew. Where Paul didn't plant, the church in some spots also grew, but not, not quite so much. You might give that one sheet too. All right. So numbers, numbers of Christians. This is from a book. I'm going to talk about Rodney Stark's book more next week. He is the premier Christian sociologist that studies the early church, not based on scripture, but he tries to tie he tries to find whatever historical resources he can and then uh, apply modern sociological techniques. And he uses sociological jargon, some of which loses me. My daughter-in-law would probably track it, but I don't track some of it. But what he says is exquisitely good, and we'll talk about it next week. But one of the things I flashed up here is a chart that he did. And there, was, there's, there have been some scholarly questions. How could the church be in the thousands early on and in the millions by the 300s. And Stark uh, said, well, I, I studied the Mormon church, Stark saying this, not Jim Haney. Uh, I studied the Mormon church and they actually had a growth rate of 43% per decade. And if you applied even a less, slightly lesser growth rate to the Christian church, and if you started with only a thousand Christians and the book of Acts said, you know, there are more than that, uh, on the first day, maybe the numbers were inflated, maybe they weren't, but he said, let's just be really conservative. Let's start with a low number of just 1,000. If you apply a 40% per decade, which is just a little bit less than a 4%, 4% a year, there's compound interest effect. But anyway, 40% a decade growth rate, you could easily go from 1,000 to multiple millions uh, in 250, 260 years. And so while these numbers, when you take them with a grain of salt, uh, they because there wasn't a census of the Christian church every year. These aren't hard numbers, but these this is probably a good thumbnail sketch of a growth pattern that other gr groups in our time have duplicated. And so if the Mormons could do it, uh, his part of thesis is with just a slightly lower growth rate, uh, the church could grow. And we'll talk about the reasons why some of them are mentioned in uh, the Dowley book, uh, the Christians loving each other, all that uh, schmaltz, schmaltzy stuff like caring for each other in the midst of a cruel world. Well, actually, that probably is hugely significant as to why the church grew and also sharing word of mouth and all that. 
But it gives us a good thumbnail that the church starts small. And this is fascinating to me, too. Uh, the percentage of the Roman Empire population starts out tiny, just fractions of a percent. Uh, but then by the late two, mid to late 200s, it's starting to become significant. Uh, and it's interesting that persecution, we'll talk about persecution in a couple of weeks. Persecution is more sporadic and light when the church is not as much of a threat. The bigger the church gets, the more of a threat it is perceived to be, and persecution cranks up. The worst persecution we'll talk about uh, is between 303 and 311. Uh, so right at the end when Christianity is becoming a major fraction of the Roman population. But we'll save that larger discussion on persecution for a couple of weeks. So late, late 100s, let's, let's go back to the, the first century here. So if you read the book of Acts, it's very clear that Christianity starts out as a branch of Judaism. It's a Jewish movement. Jesus is Jewish. His disciples are Jewish. They meet in the temple for prayers, and they go off and do their uh, weird Christian stuff, having the Lord's Supper uh, communion uh, on the side. But they, they seem to be functioning as a Jewish group. But then as Paul goes out, and as the book of Acts narrates, Peter has a vision, and there's a Jerusalem council. We've talked about all that. It starts to get more and more pushing out towards including Gentiles in the Christian church. All right. As long as uh, Christianity is a subset of Judaism, it's going to function one way. But when it becomes more independent, uh, it'll function a little bit differently. But part of the advantage of being a subset of Judaism is Paul was able to travel pretty widely, good Roman roads, uh, empire-wide peace didn't hurt. Uh, it was easier to travel during the Roman Empire than it would be until the 1800s in Europe. Uh, once Rome collapsed, travel became much more difficult until recent times. So Paul was able to travel widely. There was one language that was spoken in the entire eastern half of the Roman Empire, uh, Greek, uh, and some Latin as well, uh, but Greek, so he could preach, travel widely. And the other thing that helped is when you're under the Jewish umbrella, the Romans didn't like the Jews, but they respected them. Uh, they thought they were weird, but they also knew that they were very, very old, and Romans loved old. And they knew Judaism was older than Rome itself. Uh, so that, that gave the Jews a pass. So as long as Christianity is under the umbrella of Judaism, uh, things are going to play differently than when it's kind of an independent group. We'll talk about that more in two weeks with persecution. But then the, the Romans, the Jews rebelled. There was a rebellion in the 70s, another rebellion in the 120s. But in the 70s, the Romans came in and destroyed the temple, leveled it. Just uh, there's a large artificial mesa uh, that the temple was built on, and they literally just scraped it clean. You can see the rubble. Uh, they've excavated the rubble below. They just scraped clean the mesa, and the walls went down to the valley below into the street uh, and just, you know, just leveled the top of that. So the temple was gone. And the, the locus of Judaism switched from temple-based to synagogue-based. The synagogue movement had already started. The Pharisees were the ones who promoted synagogues as places for local learning. Uh, but when the temple was gone, synagogues are the, the only show in town, literally. And, and there are more of them. And so it's more synagogue-based. It's interesting, at about this time, the synagogues look like they're starting to expel Christians. And the Jews and the rabbis in their writings start to take on a really nasty anti-Christian tone in many writings. Uh, there are also some prayers added to Jewish liturgies, uh, thanking God that I'm not one of those heathen nasty Christians. Uh, <laughs> Jewish men also thank God that they were male and not nasty females, but that's another, that's another <laughs> thing there. Uh, so it, it, it looks like if you read, especially not so much Mark and Luke. Luke is a Gentile work, but Matthew is a Jewish gospel. And Matthew seems to be really hurt. Uh, and so anything Jesus says uh, that's anti-Jewish, and, and John also does this, uh, because there is this tension between Judaism and Christianity at this point, Matthew and John want to make sure that the lines are pretty bright too. They're pushing us out. Uh, they're saying there's a bright line between us. Well, by golly, we're going to make sure there's a bright line between us. So Christianity really in this period, and it will accelerate in the second century, but in the late first century, it's becoming less of a Jewish movement and more of a Gentile movement. Yes, there's probably still hundreds, thousands of Jewish Christians, but it becomes more and more Gentile as time goes on. All right. 
uh, I, I mentioned this, Christianity is small early on. Uh, it's really kind of flying under the radar. The first big persecution is in 64 under Nero, but he's just looking for a scapegoat for the fire. We saw that with Tacitus. Uh, but I'll, I'll come back to this in a couple of weeks, and I'll probably say it again. In the early centuries, persecution is very sporadic, very rare, and very regional. It, it might raise its head in one city for just a little while, and then it blows over pretty quick. There will be some systemic, tough, empire-wide persecutions later, but those are going to be later, late 200s, very early 300s. The other thing that the Romans thought at this point, too, is they, they underestimated what, how Christianity was structured. And they thought if we can just take out a few bishops here and there, um, take out some leaders, take out some apostles, uh, then we'll cut the head off the snake, the rest of the snake will wither and die. And that didn't work so well. Christianity, even though we had clergy, and you know, I, I think clergy are necessary, you may, may or may not, but uh, even though Christianity had clergy, a lot of the Christian movement was more lateral. Uh, you didn't need clergy to go out and make converts. Uh, sure, you, you brought them in, you had baptismal services and all that in the assembly. Somebody had to lead the assembly, uh, lead worship, but the leadership was more diffuse. And so the Romans made a, a miscalculation at this point by just going after ordained leaders because there was a lot of leadership mm -hmm. elsewhere in the, in the Christian world. And uh, it'll get more vicious later on. I'm gonna spend time on that in a couple of weeks. So again, this is kind of our, our general pattern. And, and, and why, why were the Christians kind of regarded uh, as, as a group that it was suspect more and more? We, we saw from 116, we've looked at Tacitus several times, but in strong language he uses, uh, Christianity being a deadly superstition. Uh, he, it's from Judea, the origin of this evil, but uh, it's also now in Rome and it's horrible and shameful, just like all the other horrible, shameful stuff that lands in Rome. Well, this is what the, the Christian's neighbors thought about Christianity. They were atheists, number one. That seems strange to us. Atheists, they said they don't worship the Roman gods. They're anti-gods. That makes them atheists. Uh, this one god stuff, that, that doesn't count. Uh, they're against the gods. They're atheists. Uh, they were accused of being cannibals. Their central meal involved eating flesh and drinking blood. Uh, now, if you're not in on what that means, uh, the neighbors could think, hmm, that's kind of odd. They're talking about eating flesh, drinking blood. Uh, there was a charge that they were an incestuous movement. They were all brothers and sisters. They called themselves that. And they were doing this kiss of peace uh, thing right in the middle of the service, uh, passing the peace by kissing each other. Hmm, uh, that, that sounds kooky. And uh, also their, their services are called love feasts. And so that blew up into accusations of being engaged in orgies. Uh, so this is, this is the, uh, these are the charges against Christianity in the culture. It, it was not uh, viewed as a positive thing. Uh, however, and, and Stark talks about this, and Dally talked about some too, they also care for each other. Uh, they care for the poor and those on the margins uh, in ways that people fell through the cracks in the Roman Empire and the Christian church. Uh, yeah, Mark. What are the Jewish people participating in like the civil religion? Rome, so that they weren't accused of being I'll talk more about this in two weeks. The, the Jews got a pass. The, were you here when I said that? Oh, no. Okay. The, the Romans, and I'll say this again in a couple of weeks, but the Romans loved antiquity. They did not like Jews, but they respected their antiquity. Mm -hmm. And so they gave them a pass. And so what the Jews were allowed to do, and we'll talk more about civil religion and emperor <laughs> worship in a couple of weeks, but the Jews got a pass. Uh, Okay, everybody else in the empire uh, should worship Caesar or should you know pay obeisance to the gods or whatever. But for the Jews, and the Jews made this deal, they said, we will not worship Caesar, we will not do that, uh, we will not cross that line. But every day in our temple, until the temple was destroyed, we will offer a sacrifice on behalf of Caesar's good health. Uh, hope Caesar's doing great. Uh, God save the king, basically. Uh, you know, we'll offer sacrifices on his behalf. Uh, we'll include him in the prayers of the people. They didn't say that, but uh, you know, whether we like Caesar or not, we'll we'll offer a sacrifice on his behalf. We won't sacrifice to him, and that wasn't starting up in Rome so much. We'll talk about this in a couple of weeks, but yeah, it's a good question. Good question. All right, and there's some other Roman. Uh, we talked about Tacitus. I'm going to look at some other correspondence uh, in a couple of weeks too. 
dealing with uh, how to treat early Christians. But let's let's talk really quick about uh, some writings that are right on the cusp between New Testament times and the second century. Scripture didn't come down from heaven. The New Testament didn't come down bundled in a, a gold ribbon, and God didn't say, this is Scripture. Uh, the church through the Holy Spirit had to really wrestle with things. Are these books to be regarded as equal to the Old Testament? Eventually, they said yes. Okay, which books? Well, these 27, they eventually said yes. Uh, but that was actually, it was a process of centuries before they got to that point. Uh, and so there were some books that were kind of suspect. Uh, Rome, Revelation was the most suspect. In the books that we have in the New Testament, that almost didn't make the cut. Uh, Hebrews, to a lesser extent, almost didn't make the cut as well. But on that line, there are a few writings on the other side that did not make the cut that almost did, and that were included in some early lists of books that should be treated as important as the Epistles of Paul or the Gospels, uh, quasi-Scripture. And later the church will say, and we'll, we'll talk about some of this, that you know, the, the writings of the New Testament, we're going to regard those as equal to the writings of the Old Testament. They are the Word of God. Uh, we treat them as Scripture. You know, Paul talks to Timothy about uh, you know, what Scripture is. He's not referring to his own writings. He's not referring to the Gospels that have not been written yet. He's referring to the Old Testament. Uh, the Gospels will come later, and the church recognizing those as Scriptural will come later. But here are three writings you may or may not have heard of that really were debated. Uh, should they be included? And, and they really date to about the same time as the Gospel of John and the, and the book of Revelation. And so they are of that same era, probably late 90s or very, very early hundreds. And uh, one of them is the first epistle of Clement, 95-ish. Uh, I'll talk about each of these in turn. Uh, another is the Shepherd of Hermits. That was actually a very popular book. Uh, that of all the books that didn't make the cut, that was probably the closest to uh, being included in the New Testament. And, and the Didache, and we'll, we'll talk about that uh, as well. So, first Clement. Uh, one Clement, as the, as the British say, or sometimes you see it as the Epistle of Clement to the Corinthians. So, purportedly, this is from Clement I, uh, the, uh, first, uh, the first Clement to be a bishop in Rome. He's probably either the third or the fourth pope. There are two different lists. You got, you got Peter on the list and Linus, and then there's sometimes somebody else inserted, and then Clement. Uh, so he's either third or fourth in line. And, you know, retro, retrospectively, we give them the title popes. Uh, that's not what they're calling them at this point. Uh, they're barely calling them bishops of Rome. I mean, that's, that, that's just starting to become their identity at this point. But Clement is in that line, and he's late 90s. And he writes this long letter to the Corinthian, to the Corinthian Christians saying, uh, I've heard that you uh, got rid of some of your clergy and they weren't naughty. They weren't doing bad things. You just were kind of, uh, you kind of had lousy re reasons for getting rid of them. Uh, you really should think about bringing them back. Uh, you shouldn't just get rid of clergy you know, willy nilly. Now, if they were involved in some kind of scandal or doing something horrible, then sure, please. Uh, so Clement writes this long letter about that. It is interesting, at this point in the church's history, Clement does not seem to make a very bright distinction between the Episcopoi and the Presbyteroi. The Episcopoi are those, that, that office that will later be called bishops. Uh, Episcopal comes from that same Greek word, means bishop. Uh, the English word bishop, pisco, uh, bish, bishko, bish, bishko, bis, bishop. Uh, Presbyteroi is what I am. Uh, the elders, the priests, priest will later be, in, priest is an unfortunate word in English. Uh, the presbyters is probably the better word. I am a presbyter who serves as a priest also, but my priestly ministry is very tiny. My presbyteral ministry is the bulk of what I do. Uh, I know we use the word priest, and in English, there's one word priest that kind of covers two different types of uh, priesthood. Uh, I don't sacrifice goats on the altar. Uh, probably the only thing I ever sacrifice like that as I do. We do burn up some incense occasionally on Christmas and Easter. That's that's probably the, the one of the few times I, I sacrifice in that way. Now I remind us of the sacrifice of Jesus. We celebrate the Eucharist. I preside at that. But that really is more as a presbyter or elder uh, than as a priest that sacrifices things. So that was kind of a digression. But back to Clement, uh, it doesn't seem that he, in his mind, at least in his writing, it doesn't look like there's a big, bright distinction between the Episcopoi and the Presbyteroi at this point. Those will 
kind of harden into other uh, more distinct ministries and roles later, but they're kind of overlapping quite a bit here at this point. The other thing that um, Clement does is he quotes a number of epistles, and we think he, we, the scholars think he's quoting the book of Acts. It's not exactly explicitly clear, but it looks like he's got a copy of Acts, and it looks like he's got a number of epistles, and he quotes from them as instruction to the Corinthian church. So already by the mid-90s, it looks like the early church is preserving some of these writings. They didn't just go off into the ether somewhere, but Clement is able to quote them somehow. Uh, we don't know what kind of library he had, uh, how many of these writings he had, but he is quoting from St. Paul. It looks like he's quoting from Acts too, uh, Acts also. So that's kind of a fascinating little window that we get. Now this is, he doesn't say much about the history of Jesus. You know, really in the first century there, like we said, there are very few outside of the New Testament references to Jesus' life and history and all that. But we do get some windows into the early church through First Clement. One of the main reasons First Clement didn't make the cut into the, New the Old Testament, the New Testament, is that he wasn't one of the original apostles. If he had been an original apostle, he would have been in. Uh, but that was kind of what they say, well, this is great stuff, but Clement is, you know, third generation here, so nah. All right, Shepherd of Hermits. Like I said, this is probably the most popular of the of these three books. Uh, there are other books, too, that would be written later that the church would be able to reject very easily. But these were three that were older and you know, kind of written at the same time as some New Testament writings. Uh, there's some weird stuff later. We'll get to that later on. I mean, bizarre stuff. I mean, Jesus, uh, you know, making as a child, making clay birds and then bringing them to life. I mean, just bizarre stuff. That, you know, and that's written much, much, much later. But the Shepherd of Hermas, very popular. Uh, it, it, it often is uh, listed right after the book of Acts by some early Christians in the mid-100s, late-100s, 200s, as uh, something we need to keep as an important work. Uh, it is a series of five visions, uh, and one of them is given by an angel to, uh, who's dressed up as a shepherd or is appearing as a shepherd, and he appears to a slave named Hermas, uh, the shepherd of Hermas. This is the oracle or the, the teaching of the shepherd that appeared to Hermas is where the name comes from. Very popular, uh, five visions and some, some mandates, 12 mandates, and then five, uh, 10 parables uh, that were given in these, given to this, uh, this shepherd. Um, eventually the church said, we should read this for devotional reading, uh, but we, we shouldn't include this in the New Testament. It, it just, it's a good Christian writing, but it's not, it's not equivalent to the rest of Holy Scripture, the 27 books we're going to include in there, but it just barely missed. Uh, of all of these. Yeah, sure. Now, there, there are books you can, you can go and look on Amazon. You can look on websites, the lost books of the Bible, and especially the lost books of the New Testament. What's the, I mean, what, why weren't they in the Apocrypha? Well, the Apocrypha is extra books from the Jewish people, Jewish writings, not extra Christian writings. It's a good question. These are, you could call these, you could think of these like a Christian apocrypha, things that didn't make the cut uh, in the same way. Yeah, Jimmy, go ahead. Yeah, these are all in a collection called the Apostolic Fathers, I think it's, uh, or the, it's the Apostolic Fathers, right? Right, and there are other and things, yeah. Together yeah, in yeah. But once, once we found the yeah. date, we'll talk about dedicate in a second, but yeah. Um, Jim had one question. What yeah. are they written on? I mean, not paper like we've got here. What? Usually papyrus is the uh, paper of choice early on. Now, there's some uh, vellum, some, you know, writing on leather, uh, you know, tan leather, but... That was hard to preserve. Well, and we have, we have no original sources. Right. Uh, we've got copies. Even right. with the New Testament, we've got copies. Um, we find fragments. There are some tantalizing fragments of the Gospel of John that have been dug up that look really, really old, like from the 120s or so. But they're just little tiny pieces of confetti almost, uh, but a little bit bigger confetti. But uh, yeah, the, they, they're preserved by copying more than anything. Okay. Good questions. Good questions. And, and there will be a lot of, there will be more Christian writings coming down the pipe, and the church rightly rejects them uh, for being kooky, kooky, kooky. Uh, we'll get to some of those later. All right, the Didache. The Didache is a fascinating book uh, because uh, it deals with Christian worship, and it was known about but lost. Uh, so there are references to it, 
Uh, later Christians talked about the Didache and quoted from the Didache. And until the 1880s, Western Christianity didn't have an extant copy. Uh, what is this Didache? Well, it looks fascinating. We've got some quotes in secondary sources. But uh, there's a bishop messing around in a dusty library in a monastery in Turkey, Orthodox bishop. And dang, if he didn't stumble over a copy of the Didache in the 1880s. And this was just huge. Oh, wow, we finally have it. Same thing happened in the uh, early 21st century with the Gospel of Judas. Now, the Gospel of Judas is a kooky book later on, but it was lost. There were references to it. We knew there was a Gospel of Judas, but it was lost, and then it was found. Same with the Didache, but found uh, 140 years ago. So this is really our earliest window into Christian worship after the New Testament. In my liturgy classes in seminary, this is one of the first things we look at. Then we look at Justin Martyr, then we look at Hippolytus, and because we, we get a window into what the early church did. And I'll talk more about the Didache with worship in, uh, I think, four or five weeks. And uh, we'll, we'll kind of look at 500 centuries of worship evolution in the Christian church. But one of the fascinating things it says is, yeah, you should baptize by immersion if you can, but if you need to, you can baptize by pouring. Now, uh, effusion. Um, by the way, Episcopalians can baptize by sprinkling, but you have not seen me do that yet. Uh, I baptize by effusion. I, we take a shell or some kind of my hand, and we pour water over people. Uh, it doesn't, you know, we're not Baptists, uh, you know, uh, the amount of water in Episcopal circles doesn't matter as long as it's water. Uh, now, is, is it a much better symbol to get people wet? Yes. Is it much more a, a, a representation of being buried with Christ in his death if you get really wet or even go down to the water? You betcha. I had a great baptismal font that I could immerse infants in, and uh, in Kansas, and really get adults wet. We were baptized with three gallons of water, uh, three gallon pitchers of water. Fire, <laughs> sun, <laughs> Holy Spirit, and we had you know a mat and bathrobes, and it was a it was a cool font. But in in an emergency, it can be by pouring. And later, as the church moved north, the emergency uh, baptism became more the norm. Uh, it's kind of cold to get in a river uh, in Norway uh, most of the year. Uh, and if you're baptizing younger kids, as the church does later on, uh, anyway. The other thing that the Didache has, it has some early Eucharistic prayers using some forms we still use. Uh, and we'll talk about that in a few weeks. And Didache, by the way, means teaching the apostles. You can almost think of it as a sequel to the Acts of the Apostles. Okay, Luke told you what the apostles taught. Uh, or what the apostles did, uh, now we're going to write down what the apostles are teaching us. Uh, this is what they've taught us to do. And so didache, didactic is the word for teaching. We still use that in our culture. All right. Who wrote the didache? Anonymous. We don't know. We don't know. Early, the early Christian church uh, comes out of the church somewhere. Okay, another source, this is later here. This is not on the cusp here. This is mid-2nd century. Justin Martyr. Uh, was a, a great figure. He was eventually martyred, thus his nickname. He uh, lived in Rome. He was a Christian philosopher, and he was involved in apologetics. Apologetics, we use the word apology when we usually say, I'm sorry, but an apologetic is originally a defense, which is a lousy way to apologize. Uh, yeah, uh, well, let me explain why. I'm sorry, but, uh, well, that originally apologetics were the but. Uh, this is why we do the things we do. And so apologetic writings are a genre of Christian writings. Uh, in fact, in Kansas, there was a Roman Catholic, large Roman Catholic high school just south of the church. And uh, they had to take an apologetics class to defend the Roman Catholic faith, mm -hmm. why they were Roman Catholics. And they had to go interview Protestant ministers. And uh, I always kind of felt sorry for them because they'd come, come to me and thinking I was Protestant. Well, I am, but I'm probably as close to, you know, we're the closest end of the spectrum to Roman Catholicism on the Protestant spectrum. Uh, if you guys went to a Baptist or a Church of Christ preacher, you get a very different uh, take, but, but, you know, there are going to be some sharp divisions. There are reasons I'm not Roman Catholic, and, you know, we can discuss that. But apologetic writings, and Justin is one of the first to really do that. There are others in the era we'll talk about as well. But Justin also talks about worship in the early church. And so the Didache about the turn of the century, Justin Martyr about the middle of the second century. And so we get a couple interesting windows here. Hippolytus will be uh, later still, about another 50 years down the road. So we get these windows. Nobody sat down and wrote, uh, these are instruction manuals of everything we do. It's kind of mentioned 
in chunks and in sections of other writings. But it's kind of cool to look at, especially if you're a liturgy buff like I am and many priests are. I want to mention a couple other writers real quick, Irenaeus and Tertullian. Uh, Irenaeus was Bishop of Lyon. Remember we said in the second century, France was starting to be an area of Christian uh, presence. And Irenaeus grew up in Turkey, but then went to Lyon as a bishop. Now, can you imagine a Turkish uh, Christian becoming bishop in France these days? That, that tells you the Roman Empire, how fluid things were, uh, that these national ethnic boundaries that we think of were much more fluid back then. Uh, part of the reason that the church was able to spread as quickly and easily as it did. Yes, there were tribes. Yes, there were peoples. Yes, there were languages. But there was also this overarching culture that allowed some spread. So Irenaeus, interestingly, was a disciple of Polycarp. I'll talk about Polycarp's martyrdom in a couple of weeks. Uh, and Polycarp was supposedly the last living disciple of John. And so Irenaeus basically saw himself as the grand disciple of John. Uh, my teacher had John as his teacher. Uh, so when John was an old man, my teacher Polycarp sat at his feet. And when Polycarp was a very old man, I sat at his feet. Uh, so that's kind of cool that they, they, he was still tracking that. Uh, he wrote a, a very important book against heresies. We'll talk more about what a heresy is last week. That's a loaded term in our culture. Uh, it's a much gentler term, but an important term. And we'll talk about that next, next week. Uh, Irenaeus also was one of the first to say that the writings of Paul and the writings of the gospel should be treated just like we treat the Old Testament. They are of the same gravity, weight, spiritual importance as all those Old Testament writings are. And he, he gives a list and he, 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 doesn't, he doesn't give a list. No, he does give a list. And he has 21 of the 27 books that we count as the New Testament. So they haven't settled on what the list is. There is one church, I forget where it was, that actually, uh, you, you kind of want to take them to Vegas because early on they listed the books they thought were the most important. And they listed exactly the 27 books in our New Testament. Uh, that was not a consensus by any means. One little church off of one corner of the Christian world uh, happened to land on the exact 27 books that we preserve as the New Testament. But there was other debate and discussion. But Irenaeus, uh, 21 of the books, and then he also tacked on Shepherd of Hermas as one that also needed to be included. Another figure from this era, Tertullian, uh, just a little bit later than Irenaeus, uh, priest from Carthage. He was also a big apologist. Uh, in fact, he wrote a book called Apologeticus. Uh, again, that's a reasoned defense of the faith. Tertullian is the first writer we know of that uses the word Trinity. Uh, Trinity is in the New Testament all over the place, but not as a word. We talk about Jesus. We talk about God the Father. We talk about the Spirit. Uh, and in John especially, he talks about the Father and the Son and the Spirit, uh, but never with the word Trinity. End of Matthew. Baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, but never that overarching term, Trinity. So Tertullian is the first person we know of in writing that we have evidence of that uses the word Trinity. And that will become a very important uh, word later. Tertullian also has some pithy quotes uh, that you often see out of context in all kinds of wonderful places. Uh, one of my favorites talks about persecution. He talks to the Romans, and this is before it really cranks up too, but... As often as we are mown down by you, the more we grow in numbers. The blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Uh, you try to kill us and you only make us stronger. Go for it, basically. A very, very gutsy statement. He also is famous for the statement, what has Athens to do with Jerusalem? What has philosophy to do with faith? Now, he's a trained philosopher, which is fascinating, but uh, the faith is much more important than Greco-Roman philosophy. Uh, Another very famous quote, look how the Christians love one another and how they're ready to die for each other. Uh, famous quote from Tertullian. And, and one of my favorites, I think this may have been in the book too. Uh, he also says, if the Tiber rises, if the Nile doesn't rise, if the heavens give no rain, if there's earthquake, famine, or pestilence, straight away the cry in the culture is, the Christians to the lion. Uh, persecute the Christians if anything goes wrong in the natural world. And then he jokes and says, what, one lion? Uh, to take care of the Christians to the lion, uh, they must have just, that must have been a statement that the Roman culture made. And then one lion, take care of all those Christians? You need more than that. You need a bunch of lions. But anyway, so a little bit of a sense of humor Tertullian has with that. 
All right, like Irenaeus, uh, what one of Tertullian's most important things, he is trying to defend a mainstream view of Christianity against some kookiness that's starting to develop on both sides. I'll talk more about this next week. But there are in the first century, in the second century, and even more in the third century, in the 200s, these rising strange ideas kind of on both sides of what we would consider a broad mainstream of Christianity. And Christians at that point are going to have to say, you know, we need to have some boundaries. Anything does not go. There are some ideas that are so kooky, they are out of bounds. Uh, just to let you know what the two edges are, and we'll talk more about that next week, there's an edge that says that Jesus is God, but not really a human being. There's another edge that says Jesus is a human being, but he's not divine, he's just a regular guy. Uh, and the church is trying to kind of straddle a middle way between those two extremes. And the church is still trying to straddle a middle way between those two extremes, but that's another, another topic. So next week, we'll look at that. And then in two weeks, we'll look at uh, kind of persecution over these, these three centuries here, 100s, oh, zeros, 100s, and 200s, first, second, third century. All right, questions or thoughts or comments here? About five minutes or so. Yeah, Mark. Is uh, Tertullian's quote about Acts in Jerusalem, is that from the Apologetics? Or... I'm not sure which, I'd have to look up which book that. Because what is the main point, what's the point that he's trying to make there that it could be read either it has everything to do with it or. It his, his point is, is, is that Jerusalem trumps Athens. Uh, that the faith trumps philosophy. Um, go ahead, Jimmy. Is that at that point, Greco-Roman philosophy was starting to be used heavily by the church to try to explain things in the what would become the New Testament and try to explain the faith and metaphysics and all. So they were trying to. I think that was. So was he pushing back on that? Yeah, it, well, not completely, but to try to that Greco-Roman philosophy is almost too important. It's a good, like many things, it's a good servant, but it's not a good master. Uh, you can use it as a tool. Um, we're starting the book of Hebrews today. And, and the book of Hebrews very clearly uh, uses the philosophy of Plato. Neoplatonism uh, is very important to Hebrews. That there's an ideal world in heaven, and the things we have on this earth are just reflections of it. So even the temple on earth, we won't get to that today, but that's a reflection of the real temple the heavenly temple, the perfect temple, not built with human hands. But, you know, the writer of Hebrews is very clearly steeped in that kind of Greco-Roman uh, Neoplatonic philosophy. And, and so it's great if you're going to use that to make a point about who Jesus is, fabulous. If you make that the be-all, the end-all, then Tertullian would say, you've missed the boat. Uh, the faith is more important. So. I recall actually mentioning, talking about this in a sermon three, four, five years ago, and I'd, I'd have to dig out what I was using that for, but I did quote Tertullian and talk about that. But I've slept since then, Mark. <laughs> other, other thoughts, other questions? Bob, yes. Father Jim, back to the population uh, counts. Do, do we know what the population of the, I assume <clears throat> the spread of Christianity was pretty much relegated to the Roman Empire, generally speaking. Do we know what the population of the empire was I think at they the used, time of Christ? I, I, I'm not sure at the time of Christ. I think he's using 60 million uh, at the time of Constantine as his, his base. Uh, the population of the Roman Empire will decrease uh, later on, but after, after Rome falls and all, and Rome will get much, much smaller, uh, kind of like Detroit, Michigan has got a smaller population now. Rome got much, much smaller. But 60 million, I think, is kind of the, 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 the broad number. It's probably a good thumbnail to hang your head on. Like I said, there are lots of scholars that disagree about these numbers, and we don't have wonderful census data like we would like that you can run through a computer. But 60 million is probably a good, good thumbnail to hang your head on. Does that answer that, Bob? Great. Thumbs up from Bob. I can see Bob. Y'all can't. So. <laughs> Other questions? Still got a whole minute. Yeah, Trey. From the, what do you call it? Didache? Didache. Um, when they redid the prayer book in the 70s, is some of, what, some of this new stuff actually just old? Stuff? Yes. Um, in the 70s, the, the work that helped with our new prayer book in the 70s was actually started in the 1930s. And 
the, uh, the Roman Catholics incorporated some of that with the stuff they did with the Second Vatican Council in the 60s. And yeah, part of the idea of the new prayer book is that as wonderful as our prayer book, as wonderful as our worship has been, we have imported some stuff from the Middle Ages that the early church didn't do. We got off the rails perhaps a little bit. Can we get back to some older stuff? So, you know, the right one service, uh, the, the prayers we use every Sunday are 500 years old. Those are venerable, wonderful old prayers. But in right two, prayer D is 1700 years old. And so uh, the, the, the right two prayer D prayer is much older than the uh, right one, these and thous and thy Elizabethan English prayers we use in the early service. So yeah, they're trying to get back to that. And trying to get back to making baptism more prominent, that was one of the things. Really making Eucharist and baptism much more prominent in our worship was a huge part of the, the 79 prayer book. Do you want to add some, Jimmy? Or? Yeah, well, um, the, the new prayer book, quote unquote, from the 70s, 50 years ago. Yeah, like, like the piece is the kind of the biggest example that is that, that that was something that was hugely important in the Eucharist for centuries, and then it got in the Catholic Church, it got relegated only to the Catholic, to the clergy at the altar, um, and the lay people didn't even mess with it, and same in the Orthodox Church, that it's only for the clergy, and in the Anglican Church, for 500 years, we just got rid of it completely, but it was central to the Eucharist, and it, it was central to the It was theology. important. To, yes, that's a, that's a good example, and even Paul talks about the kiss of peace, uh, so it seems that even early on, in a proto-liturgical way, that was important in the early church, so yeah, we've gotten back to that. That's actually something people do pretty well with it these days, but in the 70s, you may or may not remember, people were I'm not going to pass the peace with anybody over here. Uh, I'm, it's, it's a me and Jesus. I'm here to worship Jesus, and it's me and Jesus. And, you know, if I don't worry about these other people in the pews until it's coffee hour. Uh, <laughs> you know, then I'll talk to them. But me and Jesus. Anyway, that's, that's a good, good example. I do remember that people would sometimes have private baptism, not do it in front of the whole That was the norm uh, even when I was a, a, a young kid. Uh, baptism would happen one or two o'clock on Sunday afternoon. The godparents, the parents would show back up to the church. The priest would come back up to church and do the baptism. Uh, 79 prayer book was trying to make it part of the assembly's worship again. That We as fellow Christians, it's important for us to witness it. And it's important for us to support the person being baptized. It's not just between the family and uh, God, though that's an important piece. Uh, but it's also the church uh, witnessing and recognizing this. Consider the wider family. Exactly, exactly. The, the family writ large instead of just the, the smaller version of the family. And when I was a kid, you know, we only had communion like first and third Sundays. Well, in some churches only had communion monthly, uh, some only quarterly. Uh, in Episcopal churches, I'm not talking about other denominations. So that was not uncommon. Um, what... In the 70s, what would often be typical in Episcopal churches, the eight o'clock service would have communion and the other services then, you know, you'd have morning prayer and communion more sporadically at the later services. But yeah, there's often a first, third, second, fourth dynamic. Uh, and part of the Episcopal church was, part of the 79 prayer book was saying, we need to get back to the Eucharist being central. Uh, it's the most important thing the early church did. That was the core of who they were. And, and we've lost that. And there are reasons we lost it, which we'll get to later on in the Reformation and uh, post-Reformation era. Uh, and in some ways, the Roman Catholic Church lost its way with that, too. Uh, people would attend communion, but they wouldn't receive communion. You would go to the Mass, uh, but you wouldn't receive except on rare occasions. And so, you know, even, even the church that celebrated the Eucharist constantly like they did, the people wouldn't partake of the Eucharist constantly. It was a more sporadic thing. Twice a year. Twice a year. You had to do it twice a year. Yeah. I remember the people missing morning prayer. And so they would do a, the first part of the service was morning prayer. And sure. Switch to Eucharist. Right. Later. And that's that's still legal. We could do that. It makes for a longer service, but yeah. uh, we certainly can do that. All those little canticles and things like that, they were beautiful. The canticles are beautiful. And you know, occasionally we, we stick some canticles in. Uh, but we, that is the piece we have missed. Uh, now, of course, in theory, Christians should be praying morning prayer daily, and those canticles are there every day of the week for you to uh, avail yourself of. So. But 
not with the rest not with the not with the organist and with the choir and everything else yeah we praise thee, O God. I still remember the care. We acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth of worship be the Father everlasting. So, all right. Today I'm okay, y'all. Well, we'll stop there and pick up uh, 920 next week with the uh, second century. Third century. The 200s. 200s. Oh, it's okay. Now you're going to just I'm not sure